Thank goodness, because you never know once Carper gets that gavel what he might do with it. Uh, I've seen him in action. Um, so thank you all again for, for, for your work on the procurement front. Uh, not always, as, as Ms. Correa kind of suggested, you know, the, the best image uh, people think uh, procurement and sometimes uh, their eyes kind of glaze over. I taught a course in procurement uh, when I left the Office of Management and Budget and many of my students' eyes sort of glazed over. But by the end of the course, I think they understood that it, it really is essential uh, both for the proper use of our taxpayer dollars and also you can do you know, amazing things uh, for these small businesses in particular uh, when given an opportunity to work with government. And obviously we want the best, uh, best for uh, the services that we provide. One of the programs that I have concerns about is called FedRAMP. It's basically uh, kind of a preclearance program for cloud services. And Mr. Schneider, you knew a lot about this. Um, I think it has weaknesses that make it vulnerable to foreign-based threats targeting our cloud systems. Uh, that would include China and Russia, by the way, in terms of some of these threats. The Senate unanimously passed our bill called Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act which would address some of these issues. Mr. Schneider, have you looked at that legislation and do you think it would be helpful? So I'm not intimately familiar with the legislation. Um, however, I certainly agree with you that the FedRAMP program has some very good intentions. Um, it certainly has some room for improvement there. And I think that we have to consider supply chain risk management um, in all our acquisitions, whether it's for cloud services or, or any other mm -hmm. services that we're getting, and, and really come up with consistent ways that we can evaluate a vendor, again, for quality of product and trustworthiness of the vendor themselves and potentially any you know, legal uh, you know, oversight that their host country uh, could put upon them. I think, it's, I think it's really important that we have these reforms to, to protect these cloud-based systems, and my hope is the House will take it up and, and, and it be properly implemented. Um, what do GSA and FedRAMP programs need to do to attract small and innovative technology companies to become FedRAMP certified and to provide services to the federal government? So I, I think the struggle with small um, businesses and working to help some small businesses go through that process, uh, it, it's a very intensive and cost uh, expensive, intensive and, and expensive uh, you know, process to get through that has a lot of compliance. And so I think, A, uh, the program office at GSA uh, needs to be bigger. It needs to be better resourced to be able to, to work with more companies. Um, I think they need to seek ways to reduce the burden and reduce the amount of paperwork associated. I think mm -hmm. it also goes to being able to evaluate companies for their security outcomes um, as opposed to just for their security paperwork um, and you know the, the processes. They certainly need to have processes in place, uh, but we need more flexibility on how you can meet the security outcomes uh, for all businesses, small and large. Okay. Well, that's, that's one of our, uh, our goals here, and uh, my hope is that this legislation can pass to help protect the cloud-based services, but also we can expand uh, the number of companies that are uh, innovative technology companies that will uh, provide that service. On the Buy America laws, we talked about it in my opening statement quite a bit, but bottom line is, you know, we're spending more and more money on um, goods being manufactured uh, around uh, the country, but also $34 billion was spent on goods manufactured by foreign firms in the last five years. Department of Defense, largest purchaser of manufactured goods in the world, has spent over $200 billion on foreign products since 2007, and of course we've lost manufacturing jobs during that time period. Um, so Ms. Correa, talk about that a little bit if you would, and, and maybe one thing that would be interesting I think for people to hear is what steps does a contracting officer go through in determining whether or not to apply for a waiver of our, of our Buy America laws? Sure, certainly, thank you. Thank you for the question. So the Buy American Act is a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit challenging because you have to look at it in conjunction with other legislation such as the National Trade Agreement, the, the Trade Agreements Act and a couple of other legislations. Generally speaking, what a contracting officer has to do is first of all, they gotta make sure they're incorporating the right clauses in the contract. 
but they also have to look at the product and determine if that product is available by American manufacturers. That's done in a number of ways. They can publish it out in, in, the, uh, in the federal biz ops, um, the publication that tells contractors that we're interested in certain products or services. Typically what agencies do on an annual basis is identify all those products that they buy from foreign manufacturers and publish them so that companies out there can tell us if they can make those products or if they're interested in selling those products to the government. What I've seen is that typically what, when certain agencies are buying things like aircraft parts, parts of ships, it depends what engine they bought. And if that engine was bought by a foreign manufacturer, then you're probably going to have to buy the parts from that manufacturer. Mm -hmm. That's what I've typically seen. At DHS, one of the things that I did to improve compliance with Buy American Act, and I did this probably about six years ago when I was well into the job, was I raised the threshold for review. Instead of leaving it at the head of contracting level, it came to my level to review any waivers for Buy American Act. And that seemed to cut down the number of the waivers, but it also made us more conscious of what people were buying and how they were buying. But generally speaking, the process is they do have to look to see if there are American manufacturers out there. They do have to announce that they intend to buy this product from company XYZ, whoever they may be, so that companies can come in and tell us if they manufacture the, pro manufacture the product. Yeah. I do want to add that I think some of the recent efforts that OMB has undertaken to take a closer look at Buy American uh, compliance, I think those processes will work. I think a compliance varies by agencies based on what they buy and how they buy. Yeah. Well, as I said earlier, 2021 was sort of Buy America year. We had historic reforms to Buy America Act and expanding it. And again, I'm pleased that the executive order has been issued with regard to buyamerica.gov, the website, which is kind of a clearinghouse, as you say, that's needed to let people know both on the private side what the opportunities are, but also to let government contractors know, uh, contracting officers, procurement officers, that there is a business out there that, that can provide this. Sometimes that's lost. Uh, do you think that the transparency and the the clearinghouse element of uh, buyamerica.gov can be successful in expanding the use of U.S. manufacturers? Yes, I do believe that it can be successful, but I also think we have to do something a little bit more practical, and that is we need to get out there and talk to industry. We need to go out and understand why industry perhaps is not interested in selling certain products or mm -hmm. manufacturing certain products in support of, of government needs. Um, a lot of times it has to do with the lack of guarantees in the contracts. I think Elizabeth mentioned that in her, in her testimony, that, that sometimes these contracts, the way they're written, the company doesn't know when they're going to recover their costs, if they're going to recover their costs. And there are upfront investments the companies have to make if they're going to go into the manufacturing of certain products. Mm -hmm. So I think that's extremely important. And this all ties back to something that Grant said, and that is we got to build cohesive teams that plan the procurement properly, that think about all these factors, whether it's cybersecurity, FedRAMP certification, Buy American. When you build that team up front and you put it on the front end of the equation, you're going to write a much better solicitation, you're going to engage in a much better procurement process, and you're probably going to be bringing industry in a lot earlier to talk about what you're yeah. thinking about doing so they can get some input. So I'm and, a huge and, advocate of the coordinated teams, but yeah. you've got to get them up front. And expediting the process so that yes. it moves more quickly uh, yes. because we're moving at uh, faster and faster speeds in our economy. And particularly with inflation, we've got, we've got a real challenge right now to ensure we're spending that tax third hour most efficiently. Um, Senator Carper, when I, I taught this procurement class, it was at uh, The Ohio State University uh, at the Glenn School, now Glenn College, <laughs> your alma mater, uh, and f named after the former chairman of this committee, Mr. Chairman. OH. I hope. 